Welcome to Kansas Ag Report. I'm Ken Rogers. On this week's program, an update from By Kansas Farms, Rick McNary. We'll see what's going on with them as they start off another year. We'll also have features the Kansas Swimming Commission, Kansas Department of Agriculture, as well as Kansas Grain Sorghum, and the weekly update from the Kansas Livestock Association and market information from Pinion. Kansas Ag Report brought to you in part by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Kansas Farm Bureau, a grassroots ag organization representing the state's farm and ranch families since 1919, kfb.org. And the Kansas Wheat Commission, lending in the adoption of profitable innovations from wheat, online at kswheat.com. In agricultural information, USDA says all cattle and calves in the U.S. and Canada combined to total 98.2 million head in January 1st of this year. That's down 2% from the 100 million head January 1st of 2023. The all cows and heifers that have calved inventory was also down 2% from last year to 42 million head. All cattle and calves in the U.S. as of January 1 totaled 87.2 million head, that down 2% from the 88.8 .8 billion on January 1st of 2023. Now the all cows and heifers that had calved inventory at 37.6 million head, 2% lower than was last year. And all cattle and calves in Canada January 1st totaled 11.1 million head, 2% lower than last year. And all sheep and lambs in the U.S. and Canada uh, combined to total 5.86 million head January 1. That down 2% from the 5.98 million head January 1st of 2023. Well, USDA has announced changes to the Emergency Livestock Assistance Program, or ELAP. It provides additional assistance to producers who suffer wildfire losses of stockpiled forage during the winter months. Now, previously, ELAP covered only the normal grazing season in places like Kansas. For 2024 and subsequent program years, ELAP policy has been updated to extend the normal grazing season to 365 days a year for perennial forages only. U.S. Senator Roger Marshall led the charge for the change, working with Senators John Hoven of North Dakota and John Tester of Montana for a bipartisan effort back in 2023 to add language to the Livestock Disaster Relief Act that would ensure that future losses of the same nature are covered under ELAP. Farm Services Agency Administrator Zach Ducheneau also instrumental in securing this update to the program. USDA confirmed with Senator Marshall that this change retroactively will help Kansas producers who suffered losses during that four-county fire that took place in December of 2021. It burned some 163,000 acres and destroyed a lot of winter pasture that was already in use. Officials with the state FSA office working to establish guidance regarding the changes and producers can expect to hear more on these revisions made to, to ELAP from FSA in the coming days. And the 2017 Tax Cuts and Job Act significantly changed federal in individual income and estate tax policy, though some were temporary. You might recall in 2018, the legislation increased the estate tax exemption from about $5.49 million to $11.818 million. This increase is set to expire at the end of 2025. The exclusion amount, however, will revert in 2026 to $6.98 million per deceased person. Researchers with the USDA Economic Research Service estimate that the expiring increase exemption would be at $13.95 million per person 
at the time of the expiration and lowering the estate tax exemption level in 2026 is estimated to increase the percentage of farm operator estate tax from 0.3 to 1% and large farms would experience the largest increase in that share of estate owings estate tax increasing 2.8 to 7.3 percent. The total federal estate tax for farm estates would be expected to be more than double to $1.2 billion if this provision were allowed to expire. That's Ag News. We'll have more coming up here on the Kansas Ag Report. The Kansas Ag Report brought to you in part by Kansas Grain Sorghum. Growers working together. Learn more at ksgrainsorghum.com. Org. Grass and Grain, online or in the mail, keeping Kansas farmers informed for over 60 years. Grassandgrain.com And our guest is Rick McNary, Shop Kansas Farms. And uh, Rick, always good to catch up with you. Likewise, Kent. Okay, let's get an update now. Shop Kansas Farms kind of began back during the pandemic. It continues to go on, but so give us an update of how it is it is uh, kind of progressing, if you will. You bet. As you said, it began during the pandemic. It was a Wild West rodeo as literally tens of thousands of people joined our Facebook group every day in those first several months. As we kind of got it under control, the one of the first things we did was build a website so people could go find the farmers. And that was really critical. So, because we knew that Facebook might at some point in time shut it down. So being able to have a website that kind of train people to know, I can go to www.shopkansasfarms.com and I can find farmers and ranchers near me who sell direct to consumers. As it continued to grow, I realized it was beyond my scope to manage well and really to have the vision for it that I'd even seen. So I approached Kansas Farm Bureau about a year ago and I said, you know, if you guys would be interested in buying this off of me, because I'd set it up as a nonprofit or as a, as a LLC. Mm -hmm. And they looked at it and they said, yeah, there are three reasons that we like it. One was the Facebook group and we have 164,000 members on there now. Mm -hmm. And the communication that goes on and it's just about buying and selling food from Kansas farms. There's nothing else allowed sold on there. The second thing was the website. And since then, they've redone the website and built it out a lot better with SEO, uh, made it to where anybody that lists on the website, you know, they're legit. Because mm -hmm. yeah, those first few early right. weeks, months, we weren't sure everybody was legitimate. The third thing was this idea I'd had for a long time about how you help build a local food system. And when you think about what can't Shop Kansas Farms and that whole direct consumer model, is the in order for a, the direct consumer model to really work well for farmers and ranchers there's some principles that go on the first one is the idea that people want to buy they want to know where their food comes from that's called identity preservation i want to know i want to preserve the identity of my food i want to know the farmer so that plays huge into shop kansas farms second one is the economic concept of inelastic demand that People will pay 14 bucks for a cup of coffee at Starbucks for some reason, mm -hmm. but that inelastic demand says you know, there's a story and there's a, an emotion. Mm -hmm. And so if people know where the food comes from and can know that farmer and rancher, they're willing to pay more. But a really critical part for that to be continued to be successful is a, build, a control over the local supply chain. And direct -to consumer folks don't have that control. You know, mm -hmm. largely because processing components are lacking. So mm -hmm. what we've moved into now is helping communities start harvest hubs. Mm -hmm. And it's a combination of producers, processors, and distributors and a community coming together for economic development as well as community engagement. So we've started one in Rice County. We just got funding from the Patterson Family Foundation mm -hmm. to start one in Caldwell. Um, called it'll be called the Border Queen Harvest Hub. Mm -hmm. One thing I learned through all of this with 
with uh, the Shop Kansas Farms is people got really pretty regional. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, we want to shop Kansas Farms, right. so, you know. Get Kansas, Oklahoma wants to have their own, that's great, but we want to shop sure, Kansas sure. Farms. And so okay. even dialing that down more, so not surprisingly, economic development directors are some of our biggest fans and really pushing this through right. because they see it, it's helping. So it's assumed that that direct-to-consumer uh, market is about 15 to 20%. Okay. We're talking with Rick McNary from Shop Kansas Farms. We're going to take a quick break back with more in just a moment. Kansas Ag Report brought to you in part by the Kansas Livestock Association, supporting members' business interests and meeting consumer demands. KLA.org. Oldie Seed Farms, carrying soil specific seed. Find them on the web at oldeseed.com. That's O H L D E seed.com. And Kansas Corn, building the future at kansascorn.com. Rick McDerry from Shop Kansas Farms is uh, joining us, and he presented the Kansas Farm Bureau uh, annual meeting about uh, kind of uh, an update also of kind of where they're moving forward to. And one of the things before we went to break, Rick, you talked about uh, kind of these harvest hubs. And, and as folks want to uh, shop in Kansas, buy Kansas products, maybe from their neighbor or some a trusted source, but uh, you have found that there are some challenges in kind of making sure everything comes together as we're, for lack of a better term, in a now post-COVID world, but people still, you know, want to have that connection with their food. Yeah, exactly. As I've learned about farmers and I wrote about them for Kansas Living Magazine, one of the questions I kept putting in myself is how can I make more people fall in love with Kansas farmers and ranchers? And so as Shop Kansas Farms blew up, I saw that happen. And so there are so many consumers out there. We have a hundred, when I talk to farm groups, I say there's 164,000 consumers standing behind me who want to buy direct from you. Help them figure it out. And mm -hmm. so we've got that consumer base of people that are interested because they want to know where their food comes from. Now, you know, some folks are just after the cheapest thing they can buy. But a lot of people are like, if I, if I can meet that farmer, if I can go drive by where they are, if I can go to the processing plant, if I can talk to the, I'm willing to pay more. And, and then build that connection. Uh, another thing that illustrates that these relationships have been built. Uh, I, I worked for a guy that was a consummate salesman and he said, people buy from people. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I've seen is a lot of the people who advertised early on with Shop Kansas Farms, they kind of quit. And so I'd call them up and I'd say, you know, is everything okay? It's like, hey, yeah, we've got so many customers now, we don't need to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well. You know, and, and when people started, or when Shop Kansas Farms took off and some of the farmers were saying, is this going to go around on afterwards? I said, if you will build great customer relationships and educate people on how you do it, where, your food, where their food comes from, you're going to get repeat customers and it's going to continue. And those who have done that well have done it exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a harvest hub is then a community coming together to either build up or replace the missing parts of that food system of production, processing, and distribution. And it's usually the processing that's missing. But they do it in the context of a community. So for like example, Caldwell right now, we just got a grant to go work with them. It's gonna be called the Border Queen Harvest Hub. We've got Sumner County you know, Farm Bureau involved, Sumner County Economic Development. It's bringing all of the stakeholders in the community together, not just the producers or not just the consumers it's bringing them all and building it to where as people you know the farmers the individual farmers and processors and the and the, the way it gets distributed will have a border queen harvest hub brand oh wow okay and so that brand then ties it together sure and i've talked to kansas agritourism <laughs> said in a couple of years you're going to be able to send people into sumner county into the border queen area and they'll be able to drive around and see the food system. Mm. They'll see the producers. Oh, wow. Yeah, you because know, they'll have their own brand, their own farm, mm -hmm. but the, 
B Q double H they're calling the brand. Okay. As well as the you know because there's a cannery now in Oxford. There's a meat locker coming on. They'll have that B Q double H, and so people can go there and go. Oh, I'm gonna, the farm that's the beef that's grown out here is being processed here and it's being distributed here. So okay. tying the people together, and then also us providing the producers, especially the support with marketing, uh, just like any co-op would, to take their product mm -hmm. and help them reach a national market with it. Uh, okay. Value added or however else. So is that the future? Yeah. Yeah. So we have more than 10,000 people right now coming to our website every month. And they're from all over the nation. You know, because we've got SEO. Mm -hmm. You know, so when somebody looks for local beef, it pops up Shop Kansas Farms in New York City, mm -hmm. in Denver, you know, and being able to provide, you know, so a lot of the way the laws are set up right now, farmers and ranchers in Kansas can sell uh, consumer can buy a quarter of a beef, work with a local locker, they tell the locker how to cut it up. But the farmer, unless that locker has USDA certification, can't sell individual cuts. They can sell it by the quarter, whole, or half, but they can't sell a roast or a pound of hamburger. But if we can help them figure out ways to get that system built up, then they suddenly have a national market. And there are several farmers who have figured that out in Kansas, and they ship all over the nation. Well, well it sounds interesting, Rick. I tell you, we're running out of time, but now folks want to learn more, maybe find somebody local if they're not already, you know, uh, shopping Kansas Farms. How can they do that? Uh, just go to www.shopkansasfarms.com. You can find a farmer or producer near you. Rick, bye from. Easy to navigate. It's a great site. So, Rick, thanks a lot. Thank you, Kim. Rick McNary, Shop Kansas Farms, has joined us. We'll take a break. We'll have more coming up in just a moment. Stay with us. It's now time for the Kansas Sorghum Update, brought to you by the Kansas Grain Sorghum Commission. Today, we're providing sorghum leaders with information regarding the nomination process for the United Sorghum Checkoff Board of Directors and other opportunities to become involved with our organization with a new series of sorghum-centered events happening later this year. The USDA is currently seeking nominees to secede two vacancies in Kansas for the United Sorghum Checkoff Board of Directors. The Checkoff Board is comprised of 13 sorghum producers, including five seats for the largest sorghum producing state, three for the second largest, one for the third largest, and four at-large national positions. Sorghum producers within the United States who own or share the ownership and risk of loss in sorghum production are eligible for a nomination to the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture for appointment. Nominations are due to the USDA on May 3rd, 2024. For more information, you can visit sorghumcheckoff.com or visit our website as well by visiting ksgrainsorghum.org to express interest. The Commission is also excited to announce its latest collaboration with K-State that will launch this summer. The Sorghum Connection Series will address best agronomic practices in order to prevent diseases and other obstacles through a series of field days and producer-led panels. Be sure to stay tuned for more information as details develop. We'll be sure to keep you updated via our social media, digital newsletter, and of course, our website. Thank you and stay tuned for next time. Imagine turning soybean oil, used cooking oils, and waste animal fats into fuel so amazing. It drives U.S. jobs and our economy forward. Learn more about biodiesel at americasadvancedbiofuel.com. Commodity Classic brings value in different ways to all who attend. Some leave mesmerized by the advancement of technology and tools. Others soak in knowledge from industry experts in the lineup of educational sessions. Others still take advantage of networking opportunities to gain insight for on-farm decisions. Commodity organizations conduct critical business throughout the week. For Kansas Soybean Commissioners and Association Directors attending, Classic offers a mix of learning, connecting, and representing peers in the state. The 2024 Classic, February 28th through March 2nd in Houston, Texas, was no different. Farmer leaders like John Pratt, KSA District 3, and Gary Robbins, KSC District 7, found value in the trade show of over 400 vendors and connecting with companies whose products they use. 
Ron Oldie Commission Chairman took note of the participation in speaker presentations through the week, remarking the sheer amount of interest was amazing. With over 11,000 individuals passing through the event, Classic touted record attendance. The large crowd ensures growers meet up with someone they know or have connected with previously. For KSA Chairwoman Teresa Brandenburg, connecting with peers over shared challenges and triumphs is a highlight of attending Classic. Many farmer leaders who have participated in the Corteva Young Leader Program echo that sentiment. Building upon connections created through the trading is a favorite part of Classic. Charles Atkinson, ASA representative, pulled from EPA Administrator Michael Regan's comments in the Friday general session that the agency continues collaborating with USDA and offers farmers a seat at the table in regulatory discussions. Atkinson and five other association directors served as policy delegates to vote upon resolutions for the American Soybean Association. These resolutions establish ASA's position on legislative matters for the coming year. The value of Commodity Classic for Kansas Soybean as an organization is twofold. The Soybean Checkoff exhibits its strengths in building market and improving farmer profitability and members of KSA elevate priorities to the national level. Anything I can help you locate today? Yeah, I'm looking for some grass seed, but I can never figure out which type to buy. At Premier Farm at Home, you can pick your grass seed out of a field instead of off a shelf. Really? You can do that? At Premier, you can. That'd be great. Let me take you to our plot. Everyone has lawn problems. At Premier Farm and Home, we see it as an opportunity to earn your trust. This is so helpful. Only place in the Midwest. With each problem we help you solve, you'll gain confidence and find that no one can take care of your lawn like you can. From the earliest pioneer days, agriculture has always been at the foundation of the Kansas economy and the Kansas spirit. Hi, I'm Heather Lansdowne, Director of Communications at the Kansas Department of Agriculture, and I'm proud to be an advocate for Kansas agriculture. I hope you join all of us at KDA as we recognize the month of March as Kansas Agriculture Month and March 19th as Kansas Agriculture Day. Every March, we celebrate the contributions of the ag community and raise awareness that the crops and animals grown on farms and ranches across the state are feeding Kansas families as well as families around the world. The economic impact of agriculture is seen in all 105 counties, with 72 agriculture, food, and food processing sectors, combining for a direct output of nearly $57 billion in the Kansas economy. In Kansas, there are nearly 46 million acres of farmland, which accounts for 87% of all Kansas land, some harvested for crops and some serving as pasture land for grazing animals. In addition to growing crops and raising livestock, the Kansas agricultural sector includes food processing, research and education, renewable energy production, agribusiness, technology, and many value-added enterprises. And family-owned farms and ranches remain the backbone of Kansas agriculture. 93% of Kansas farms are family-owned. Those Kansas families are feeding the world, as Kansas exported more than $5.46 billion in agricultural products last year, the majority of which goes to Mexico, Japan, and Canada. While we're proud that Kansas farmers and ranchers are making a global impact, we're also proud of the local impact, as the history and tradition of farming and ranching in Kansas lives on today at the heart of our state's health and prosperity. Join us as KDA celebrates the past and the future of agriculture during Kansas Agriculture Month this March. Steers entered by Willow Creek Angus from Americas and heifers owned by Spring Creek Ranch of Cassidy won the overall gain contest as part of the 2023 Flint Hills Beef Fest Feedlot and Carcass Awards. The steers from Willow Creek Angus gained 5.14 pounds per day from the time they went on grass in April of 2023 until harvest from the feedlot on January 10th of 2024 while the Spring Creek Ranch heifers gained 4.6 pounds per day. Steers owned by Colton and Becca Arndt of Emporia placed first in the feedlot contest with an average daily gain of 5.28 pounds. In second place were steers from Spring Creek Ranch. The steer carcass contest was won by entries from Miller Ranch of Olpe, with second place awarded to cattle owned by Bill Burton and Roger Potter from Emporia. 
In the heifer division, the winning pin from Spring Creek Ranch also earned first place in the feedlot contest, while cattle owned by MAK Farms of Green City, Missouri finished second. Entries from Lee Glanville and Wes Cahoon of Cottonwood Falls took first place in the heifer carcass contest, with second going to entries from Don and Carol Hahn from Fall River. Hello, this is Jake McCall with Pinion Ag. The market has been quite active in all areas this week with no shortage of data to discuss. In a time with little focus on U.S. production news, the trade is carefully examining export data, ethanol production, South American harvest, and political machinations around the world. That being said, as we start with the grain markets, it is likely that most of our action this week has had little to do with fundamentals. It has long been known that the managed money funds are heavily short in the grain markets, and they remain so. But in the past two weeks, we have seen some lifting of those positions ahead of the March WASDE report that came out this week. The WASDE report, though, pales in terms of importance when compared to the end of the month planning intentions release, which will be accompanied by the quarterly stocks report. In terms of fundamental information, we did have a pretty quiet ethanol report where we averaged 1.057 million barrels for daily production, which was down 1.9% from last week and up 4.7% from last year. This did set a record for ethanol stocks for this week in the year, breaking last year's record by 0.73 million barrels. On the export side, things were strong but not blown out of the water, with corn, wheat, and soy meal all within expectations while soybeans actually surprised to the upside at 613,500 tons for the week ending February 29. On the cattle side, the cutout continues to work higher above the $300 level, strongly supported by lean trim markets. Fat cattle trade over the past week has largely been in the range of 182 to 185, with a little bit of 186 sprinkled in here at the end of the week. Depending on the location, as Packers have been uh, slowing chain speed and cutting slaughter numbers in an effort to keep a lid on prices for the moment. Cattle have traded largely sideways over the past 30 days, especially in the deferred contracts, and it may be time that we'll need to see some development in prices as the April board pr uh, remains premium to cash by a few dollars. In outside markets, crude oil remains in a solid, up solid upward channel as it meets resistance around the $80 mark, Equity futures stare down new highs, and the dollar has taken a beating over the last couple days. If you would like to work on your marketing plan or have any questions about the markets, we'd love to talk to you about it. You can call us anytime at 888-452-8751. My name is Jake McCall with Pinion Ag, and I hope you have a great day. That's our show this week. Be social with us online, kansasagreport.net, or our social media channels. I'm Ken Rogers. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back with you next week on another Kansas Ag Report. Many seed companies claim to offer the latest genetics, but how many have tested those genetics in soils just like yours? The Oldie Seed Know to Grow Research Program has fully tested the latest seed genetics in soils that are right in your neighborhood. The Oldie Seed Know to Grow Program can recommend the best performing hybrids from technologies like Enlist, Extend, and Liberty Link that will optimize the yield and profit of every acre on your farm. Contact Oldie Seed today.